he had been watching the Olympics. Uh, I hear different ones saying, yeah, I watched the Olympics. I like this. I like that. You notice what I'm, I have paid attention to. It seems like uh, the sports that we're going to really do good in, uh, they put them on, on the air. The ones that were, the ones that we're not might be going to do but so good in, they don't put any on there. Uh, uh, but we noticed that uh, in that, there's always a hero. There's always a person who has been elevated above everybody else uh, to do uh, a standing, uh, outstandingly, amazingly, more abundantly than anyone else is going to be able to do it. Now, there was a young lady that was swimming the other night, and uh, as a matter of fact, I think Hunter uh, made a post. He said something to the effect of it. He said they think they finished her interview before second place came in. I mean, she did so well swimming. But, uh, but the truth of the matter is uh, there's always somebody that seems to be elevated, and no matter what form or format that we have in life, well, regardless if it's the Olympics uh, or, or whatever, Michael Phelps has how many uh, gold medals now? You know, 20-some. And so, uh, you know, for, for us, we're like, well, I didn't know he had three. But, uh, you know, for others, you know, it's like it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And, and so when it comes to swimming, uh, you know, he's the man, you know. Or, or this person over here in gymnastics, she, she's the greatest, and she's going to be it. And, and so it goes on and on and on, and we're always looking for that great supreme. We're, we're looking. We need to have something to, to hold up above everything else. Now, in the synchro diving, I think that was David Badiah. I never heard of their names before, and Steele Johnson a until the other night when uh, Kelsey had it on, and they were watching the diving, and, and they got out, and when they won the silver medal, uh, they stood there, and when they said, wow, what does this mean to you? And he says, it really means nothing. Uh, first of all, he said, until I acknowledge that my, my identity is rooted in Christ. In other words, Jesus is the man. And, he, and from there on, it makes it easier to do whatever I do. And, and both of them made the same acknowledgement. And for you and I, we need to ask ourselves, can we really say, Jesus, you're the man? Uh, no matter what you gift me in, no matter what ability I've been given in this life to do, uh, are you first and foremost? Are you the man? Uh, I, I think we need to understand that for many of us, the struggle we're going to come down to is going to boil down between two words. That's going to be this word prominence or preeminent. And sometimes in the understanding of the words, we understand that if Miss Cheryl came and she sat down to teach these kids, she's in a prominent place. She's been placed in a prominent place so that uh, the kids can come forward and she can, they can acknowledge her and we can see what's taking place and we can say, but is she preeminent above all things in God's kingdom? Jesus is. And for many of us, we, we, we try to say, well, I'm going to believe in Jesus but, but, and I can give him a prominent place, but I don't know that I can give him preeminence in my life. Well, Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, that we need to be making Christ a priority above everything else. And he tells us in verses 15 through 23 these words. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is beginning in the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through, the death, through death to present you uh, holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You see, what happens is in the Olympics is we want to build up. We build up in anticipation. We build up. We want to win. We want to, 
We want to excel. We want to succeed. And the challenge is that sometimes in our own mind, we become the victor. And the Bible reminds us that no matter how hard we'll work, no matter how hard we will try to excel, we'll never be able to do that. We try to associate so many things. Now, I, I, I'm a Second Amendment person. I, I believe in owning guns. I, I don't believe in walking around shooting the random person. But I believe I should be able to have a, 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 a weapon in my house to defend, defend my family. Or, or if I want to go out and do some dove hunting or whatever, I should have the right to do that. Uh, I, I notice in the Olympics we have shooting sports. And, and we've done fairly well in shooting sports, and yet uh, you don't hear or see that publicized on TV. You do, the, the, the major sponsors are, are staying away from them. You're not going to see a McDonald's ad, or you're not going to see Coca-Cola uh, uh, patch on any of the shooters, uh, uh, you know, shooting vest or anything like that. But, but what we have to understand is that there are millions and millions of dollars spent every year on symbols and logos to help us be associated with something. Now, when, when, when my daughter Kelsey was a little girl, one of the first things that she noticed was the McDonald's Golden Arches. I mean, we could ride by when she started learning how to talk, and she started learning to talk early, and, and, and she's about like Stella. There's certain words she just picks up, and she throws them at you. And, and so we'd be riding down the road, and all of a sudden we'd see off in a distance somewhere. You really had to look for it, but her little eyes were like hawks, and they were seeing, the, and she would see it, and she says, McDonald's, McDonald's. And we were like, well, we, we, we're not going to McDonald's. McDonald's, McDonald's. And it was McDonald's all the way there until we either pulled in or made her mad and drove by. You, you see, but she noticed that not because she recognized the word, but because they had invested so much money and time and energy that when you see something, you automatically know what it is and what it stands for. And the Bible is trying to help us understand that, that, that if we're going to be followers of Jesus, that, that, that when people look at us, they need to know who we stand for. And the reason for that is, first of all, that Jesus is over all creation. There's nothing out there that has not been made. You notice what he said? He said, he said, well, if it's visible things or invisible things. Now, I've never seen many invisible things. But what he's really saying is there's things... They're never going to be seen by your eyes that he has created. He is the image, the Bible says in verse seven, uh, 15, of the invisible God. That, that key word is image. Now, when I worked at Hatteras Yachts many years ago, it has been many years ago now, uh, I started working there 30 years ago. I can't believe that. Now, you know, I sound like one of the folks of a different generation that are sitting around here uh, when I say that. But 30 years ago, I worked for Hatteras Yacht Company uh, out of Newburgh, North Carolina, and, and I was a painter. I, I, and and I, I began to hone my skills as a painter there, uh, and, and that's how I ended up in the automotive industry. But I had a friend of mine that I'd gotten to know we, when we meet in the break room that he worked in the fiberglass, the mold-making department, you know, where they make the molds for those big hulls. He'd been working there for 20 years at the time. And so basically, any, any, any big, nice boat that had been made by, by Hot Hatteras Yacht, the hull had been made by the, the, the mold for that hull had been made by this man and the crew of men that he worked with. And so everything to keep it uniform and have a certain pattern had to go through that mold. And so it was in that image. It, it, it's, he, you, you see, that was just a replica of what had been made. But yet the word here that's being used is not that Jesus is a replica of the real thing. He said he is actually God. He's God in the flesh. He is the incarnate. He's the, he's the one that came in the form of that baby that we'll celebrate in just a few months from now. You see, Jesus, well, he's God. And sometimes for us, that statement seems too simple. We, we might just put it off. It, it seems so simple that maybe we in, it overlook the significance of what we're really saying. When you come in here and you say, I come to worship Jesus, and then yet at the same time, we'll say, Heavenly Father, or we'll say, Dear God. And you say, well, who are we praying to? We're praying to one and the same. A minister told a story 
uh, some years ago about being a minister in a small church and and there was a cemetery that backed up to his house, and he lived in the parsonage. And he said, and the way it was is at some point in time, the old home didn't originally have a bathroom in it, but they had closed in part of the back porch and made a bathroom. And in that bathroom, there was a window. Now, here's the kicker. The window was in the shower. There was a curtain, naturally. But on the back door one day, and you have to understand, uh, the small area where they lived at, Across the cemetery, there was a kingdom hall of Jehovah Witnesses. And he said he heard on knocking on the back door, uh, back porch one day, uh, at somebody at the door. said he looked out and there was a couple of young men. He could tell probably they were from the, the kingdom hall of Jehovah Witnesses. And he's there in the shower. And he said, but they were relentless in knocking. So he, 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 he pulls the curtain back and says, I'm in the shower. <laughs> he peeks out. And they begin a conversation with him <laughs> through the window. Wanted to talk to them about uh, sharing them about their knowledge about who they were and what what they what what they believed in. Now, now don't get me wrong. I love the resolve of the Kingdom Hall, Joe Witnesses. You know, they'll, they'll come to your house. As a matter of fact, they they dedicate eight hours a month to to knocking on door to door evangelism is what they call it, and they, they go around in the community. So if you see them, it's because they're required to do that. But the thing about them is, they don't teach the same thing that you and I would believe about Jesus Christ. You see, rather they teach that Jesus was Michael, the archangel, and then he comes down to heaven. When he gets here, he becomes Jesus, but then when he ascends back to heaven, he takes up his role as Michael again. Now, that's where you and I as Christians are going to have a big problem because if that's the case, then Jesus is not really God. And how can we follow him? How can we come around his table and observe what he's done if he's not really who he says he is? If he's not God, then that changes the importance of the ministry that Jesus had. It lessens the gift of God that gave us through him. If Jesus is not God, that lessens the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. I mean, after all, am I following God or am I following Michael? If Jesus is not God, that would mean that Jesus is a liar. Because Jesus himself even says this in First John chapter 14, verse 9. He says in the latter part of that verse, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? John also says in John chapter 1, as, as Cheryl mentioned to the young children, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see? And so the angel of the Lord, when he appears to Joseph, and, and he's there as he makes the announcement that Jesus is coming, and, and Joseph's trying to decide what's going to happen. He said, I've got this woman that I'm supposed to be marrying, and now I'm finding out she's carrying someone else's baby. And he's deciding whether to put her away privately so not to embarrass her and even himself. And the angel comes and talks to him, and he says, No, you need to understand what's going to take place here. This is from God. He says, As a matter of fact, in verse 23 of chapter 1, he says, uh, you, you know, he's, he's Emmanuel. And his name means God with us. You see, that's what we have to hold on to. And no matter what other people try to teach us, we have to understand that Jesus Christ, he's God. And if he's God, then he has to be the man. He has to be in charge of everything else that goes on in life. He's the Lord of creation. But the Bible also tells us in this passage from Colossians chapter 1 that he's the head of the church. We struggle with that at times because the head of the body, where well, the body's the church, that means there has to be a head somewhere. In other words, an, another image that Christ, uh, that, that Paul wants to, us to envision about him is comparing the church to a physical body. So he says, can you imagine there being a body? Well, everybody needs a head. If you don't have a head, what's going to happen? The head, excuse me, the head controls which way the rest of the body's going to go. Now, when I was a kid, I had a distinct pleasure. We don't do this anymore, hardly ever, but I had a distinct pleasure. When I was a kid growing up, my grandfather grew, he, he raised hogs and chickens and those kind of things. And some of you say, yes, I know exactly where you're going with this. And, and so as a result of that, uh, a couple of times a year, there would be one time a year we had a big hog killing. We would, we would, we, he would slaughter his own animals and put away the meat. And, and then a couple of times a year, uh, 
you just needed some more chickens in the freezer. You just went ahead and said, let's get us kill some chickens. You know, Papa said, we've got some of these over here. They quit laying. We need to get rid of these. Or here's this mean old rooster. He's spurring everybody. He's the first one to go. And uh, so, you know, you'd get those, you know, you get these chickens. And, and it's not like people. If you take the head off a chicken, you put him down, he's going to run all over this building in here with no head on it. He's just going to do it. I don't know how it happens. I don't know why it happens. As long as his, bub, his, his heart pumps, he's going to keep going. And, and, and so I, I think sometimes, uh, you know, I'm glad I don't do that anymore. It's so much easier to go down to Elias's and pick up a nice fresh chicken when I need one. <laughs> and let somebody else worry with that. But I think sometimes the church can act the same way if they get away from the head. If they get away from Jesus, the church can act that way. I mean, the church loses their awareness of the head and, and, and what it's like to be, con, be, be controlled by him. And as a result of that, sometimes the church gets out of control. And which leads to serious, a serious question. In the church that you attend, where does Jesus sit? Does he have a prominent place? Or does he have a preeminent place? Does everything that goes on through the church, does it, does it run through Jesus or does it run through wherever we say we want to put him? You see, when we give Jesus a prominent place, we can, when we meet together or make decisions or whatever the case may be, we can give Jesus a prominent place when we mention him in the things that we do or, and, and various activities that go on, but are we really following his lead? We have to be careful as a church. You see, prominence has given him a high place, but it doesn't mean it's also most important, the most important place. He deserves to be in charge. And, 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 and he demands preeminence. And so whatever you think about Jesus, you know, Mac, don't be put in your mind. You're the man. You're it. Uh, wherever I need to be, whatever needs to be going on, Jesus, you're the man. I'm going to struggle with it. Don't get me wrong. But you're the man. And why? Because Jesus, the Bible says, has reconciled us to God. Not something I could do. I can't do it. I, and no matter how hard I work, no matter how many sermons I would preach, no matter how much giving I would do, no matter how much I would get out and be involved in, in charitable organizations, no matter what I do, I can't reconcile myself to God. Only Jesus can do that through the blood that was shed on the cross. You see, he, reconcile means to reestablish a close relationship with, to settle or resolve. That's what reconcile means. And so we need to ask ourselves, have I been reconciled? And if so, what am I doing to be faithful? And if not, what do I need to do? I think there's a word that really jumps off the page in verse 15. It's the very first word, believe it or not, in, in verse 15, uh, 23 of, of chapter 1, excuse me. And it's simply this word, it. See, a lot of people would say, well, uh, I don't believe you can lose your salvation. I, 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 I went through this class or I did whatever when I was a child or or whatever the case may be, or I remember going to youth camp, or there was one time there was a revival, and I came forward, and I did so-and-so, and, -so, and I, I have lived a completely different life since then, but I, I still think I'm saved because the man told me that I was saved forever. And, and so as a result of that, I think I'm saved. And here's the word that jumps off the page. If. If what? If you remain faithful. If you remain steadfast. If you stand firm, if you hold on, these are the things that he reminds us of. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 says, Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. You see, the main idea here is, is that losing your salvation is only an issue for those who really don't want to let Jesus be the man. You don't want him to be in charge of your life. And so as a result of that, uh, I think it's one of these situations where he says, it's only an issue for those who ask, how little can I do to get by with and still get by? We run into that a lot, don't you? You go out in the community where we, where, where we live and, and you ask somebody for some 
uh, service of some sorts, could be in a restaurant or anything else, and, and they're like, I'll get to you whenever I get to you. And you bring your food, and you say, well, it's cold. Well, it was hot when they cooked it. That's the mentality, you know. And it's like, how, how little can I really get by with and still get by? And, and I think for sometimes with us as Christians, we have that same, 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 same mindset. Two and a half men would show, you know, two men raising the brothers. They were raising one of them, had a son. And the young man comes home, and he's got his homework. And his dad that's looking over, he's the responsible one. He's looking over his son's work, and he says, why don't you do this problem here? You see right here, this is a problem right here. You didn't do that. He says, well, that one's extra credit. And he says, yeah, but why didn't you do it? He said, you don't have to do it. He said, but why didn't you do it? He said, you don't understand. It's extra. <laughs> and I think for us as Christians sometimes, we, we, we know God's calling us to something. We know that he's given us a certain task. We, we, our identity has been rooted in Christ. We know who we belong to. We trust Jesus. And he gives us a certain task in life because he's gifted us to do it. But then maybe along the way he says, but I'm going to give you a little something extra, and it's for extra credit. Would you do it for me? And you say, I can still get a good grade the way I'm going. Why do any extra? And there's our challenge, isn't it? Because Jesus asked me to. And since he's the man, I should be willing to do so. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, in life, we're not going to be perfect. I've been telling you about working on cars for Trey and, and different things and it seems like every time I go over there I get another scar or something blood's running and, and I'm wearing band-aids on a regular basis and and uh, I've got scars that reminded me of the ones I've had from years of working in the automotive industry and <clears throat> I can't tell you the number of times I've been to the emergency room or uh, or a uh, quick care to get a stitch here and there uh, they're scars Life's that way, isn't it? You're going to have some scars. There's going to be some things that are just not, you know, it's going to be a reminder of where you've been and what, what's going on in your life. It's going to happen. And sometimes I think for us, we, we get to thinking, well, because of all my scars and the things I've been through and stuff I've done, uh, I'm never going to be good enough. I'm not going to be perfect. I'm not going to be whole. Uh, God's not going to want me. And yet, that's what this passage is reminding us, that God, because of who Jesus is, you notice what Paul's done? He set up who Christ is. He was there from the beginning. He helped do all the creating. He was there in, in the understanding of who, and you, who you and I were going to be. And, and not only that, he, he comes here to earth, and he establishes his kingdom here in, in the form of the church. And as a result of that, now because of the sacrifice that has taken place on the cross and the blood that Jesus shed, he now reconciles us. He has paid for the sins that we have committed. And let me go ahead and throw this one out there that you will continue to commit until you go meet Jesus face to face. And here's what takes place in this. We've got to make a choice. Is this the person that I would give my life to? Is this the person who deserves to put me, if I want to take a place, not the preeminent place, can I take a prominent place in my life because God wants to elevate me? I can take a prominent place. I can be here on the stage. I can be telling you about Jesus, but I can't be Jesus. And I think for many people sometimes, we want to be Jesus in our own life. And it doesn't work that way. And so Satan reminds us of all the scars and all the band-aids and bandages and everything else that we've gone through and the heartbreaks and the bad choices. And he says, you're just not going to be adding up. You're not going to cut the mustard. I'm sorry. And then there's this whole thing about he has reconciled us to God through his sacrifice on the cross. He has taken our sin. He removes them from us. The Bible reminds us as far as the east is from the west. And that's a long ways. I mean, that's just a, I don't know. I can't fathom the distance. But God says, I can take them away from you if you're willing to give them to me. But I need to have preeminence. I need to be the man. 
and say, here's where you and I stand. Today, you make a choice. Do you give him that place? Or do you just give him a good place? Can you say today, Lord Jesus, today in my life, you're above everything else. I've been there. I've tried to do that. It doesn't work for me, so you need to go there and take care of it. Or will you still say, you're good. Me and you are good, Jesus. Meet you next Sunday at 11 o'clock. You got a good spot in my life. There's a lot of people do that. But he wants every day. He wants all day. And you have to choose to say, you can have that. Remember that word, verse 23? Little short word, overlooked. If. So today's your if day. Would you be standing? We're going to be singing sweet, sweet spirit as we have a time to come to the Lord and give our life to him. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you need. I, God does. I, I know that if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, first and foremost, you're going to have to surrender your life to him. God, you're my God. And you're my God through Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he made on the cross. I need you in my life. How do you get that? Surrender yourself to him through Christian baptism. Allow him to wash over you. Remove those old sins and give you the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how it takes place. And then walk in newness of life. In other words, you're here, God. I'm no longer there. You're here. I'm here. I will follow. I'll get there. That's what he's desiring.